Good afternoon. Welcome to the White House. You may have noticed, if you look outside, that the cloud of uncertainty <laughs> has been lifted over our economy, or almost, anyway. We hope so. Uh, I do not have any opening announcements, so I will go straight to your questions. Julie. Thank you. Um, can you give us any update on how the President is spending his time today in terms of trying to rally support for this deal? Is he making calls to lawmakers? Does he have any meetings planned? I, I don't have any scheduling updates for the President. Uh, as you know, the Vice President is uh, headed to Capitol Hill uh, and uh, is meeting with uh, the Senate and the House uh, Democratic caucuses uh, to talk about the uh, deal with them uh, and to uh, answer their questions. Um, so I think that's uh, part of the process that you talk about. I, I don't have anything specific uh, about the president. So the president doing nothing today to try to Well, no, I didn't say that. I said I don't have any scheduling updates for you or any phone calls or meetings or conversations to read out to you. He's obviously uh, been thoroughly engaged in this process uh, all along through the weekend. You saw him here last night in the briefing room, and will continue to be engaged. And I and uh, you should not take from my answer that he is not speaking to lawmakers. Simply that I don't have any specific conversations to read out to you. Can you tell us what message the vice president is taking to the Hill today, particularly for liberal Democrats who are saying this morning that the president gave up too much in this agreement? Uh, he will carry the message that the uh, deal negotiated uh, with uh, leaders of Congress is a victory for the American people. Uh, let's let's start. Uh, with point number one. The debate in this room and elsewhere in Washington in the past week was uh, would we continue for the next few months uh, leading up to the Christmas season have uh, the uncertainty caused by uh, a, a decision to relitigate the whole issue of raising the debt ceiling, would that uncertainty be continued and would that be part of any agreement? The requirement that we would vote again to raise the debt ceiling uh, within four, five, six, ten, twelve months. Uh, the, president was, the President was adamantly opposed to that, uh, precisely because it would uh, have such a negative impact on the economy, uh, and uh, that will not be part of this agreement. It is not part of this agreement. This agreement ensures that the debt ceiling will be uh, extended uh, through 2012, removing that cloud of uncertainty from the economy. Second of all, the, the agreement ensures that uh, there is an initial round of spending cuts uh, that uh, protect vital investments, uh, that will uh, ensure that the economy can continue to grow, protect vital things like Pell Grants uh, that are a high priority for the President, and significantly ensure that there is a firewall in the discretionary spending cuts between uh, defense and non-defense spending, which again is a kind of protection we haven't seen in a long time that is essential to making this a fair and balanced deal. Then there is a committee set up, a special committee, as you know, uh, by the legislation uh, that will be bicameral and bipartisan with uh, equal representation between Republicans and Democrats, and that committee will be charged with finding ways to ensure, uh, finding ways to reduce the deficit even further one and a half trillion dollars further. And everything is on the table for that committee. Everything including both entitlement reform and tax reform. And let's be clear, the President thinks, as you know, that the biggest possible overall accomplishment in terms of deficit reduction is a desirable goal, as long as it's balanced. And he looks forward to, through the process set up by that committee, to having that debate about what our priorities are. If we need to, as legislated through this deal, find another 1.2 to 1.5 trillion dollars in deficit cuts. How are we going to do that? Are we going to do it by uh, asking sacrifice only of middle class Americans or seniors, parents of children who are disabled, or are we going to uh, ask that uh, others, including oil and gas companies, corporate uh, jet uh, manufacturers or the, the wealthiest Americans share in the sacrifice? I think that is, a, uh, again, a debate he's looking forward to. Why should Democrats be confident that you'll be able to get those commitments in this special committee if you weren't able to get them up front? Well, we came very close, as you know, in a, uh, to achieving a grand bargain with the Speaker of the House. And let's be clear, uh, belatedly it was uh, conceded that in that agreement that was uh, negotiated very painstakingly, painstakingly 
between the Speaker of the House and the President of the United States, uh, revenue was on the table, and I quote the Speaker in that, including $800 billion as a minimum of revenue. Uh, so that was envisioned by the Speaker as part of a grand bargain uh, had that been achieved. Secondly, we saw uh, close to 20 Republican senators uh, endorse the uh, ideas behind the Gang of Six proposal, which included not just revenue, but two trillion dollars in revenue, okay? So I think there is an enormous potential here for uh, those who work on this committee and those who then consider it uh, with their votes to see that the best possible way to achieve significant further deficit reduction beyond the initial trillion dollars is uh, through a balanced approach. And as you know, the legislation has within it uh, an enforcement mechanism, a trigger, and the, uh, uh, the metaphor is apt because the trigger, uh, well-designed triggers uh, create uh, a huge incentive for Congress uh, not to pull them. And, and that is the case here, where uh, those cuts that would be mandated if Congress failed to act, if the committee failed or Congress failed to pass the committee's product, uh, would uh, be across the board cuts split evenly between defense and domestic uh, spending, including entitlements, although I will note that Social Security, uh, Medicaid, uh, and uh, beneficiaries in Medicare would be excluded from any harm. Uh, and again, but these are, these, the whole point of the trigger is that nobody wants to do them, and that it's equally onerous for both sides. And that, again, creates uh, uh, greater potential for the committee's action to bear fruit. And finally, just look at the big picture. You know, this debate was so contentious, and it was so partisan. What can the American people realistically expect Washington to be able to do, particularly on jobs between now and the election? That's an excellent question. And there is no doubt that the process we have seen uh, in the past uh, several weeks and months was a, a kind of a mess. And the President made clear a, a week ago today when he spoke to the nation uh, uh, from the residents that while Americans voted clearly Last November, November 2010, for divided government, they certainly did not vote for or choose dysfunctional government. And in fact, they expect when they have divided government, when they have one party controlling some parts of the government, another party controlling others, that they will work together and together find the kind of compromise uh, that is balanced, that is, more repre that is representative of where the American people want to go. Now, uh, this was a mess. There is no question. It was a circus at times. Uh, we unnecessarily uh, sent the message around the country and the globe that uh, the United States might, in fact, default on its obligations for the first time in its history. Uh, but in the end, uh, compromise won out. And an agreement that we believe strongly is in the interest of the American people was achieved. So uh, looking forward, we hope to be able to build on that. Uh, none of this is easy, because all the issues are hard. But uh, you do begin to build more capacity for compromise in the future the more you get under your belt. We certainly hope that to be the case because there's, we, we will not stop. This is an, uh, assuming, as we do and hope, that the Congress will pass it and the President then signs it. Uh, we then move on to the work of the committee and to all the other initiatives that we need to get uh, going uh, that will help create jobs and drive the economy. And we believe fundamentally that there is broad consensus in Washington uh, that we need to focus on growth and job creation. Thanks. Greg, what's the message to Democrats who see this as a capitulation, who see it as a bill that reflects more the Republican priorities than the Democratic priorities? Well, I, I just went through, I think, a number of, uh, uh, of arguments that we uh, are making about why this is uh, such a strong agreement, why it is, it, no doubt, it is a compromise. It is not a perfect agreement. It is not the one that uh, the President or Democrats would have crafted if uh, only they controlled all levers of government themselves, obviously. Uh, but it does uh, accomplish some significant things, which I just went through with Julie. Why should Democrats in particular support this bill? Because it protects uh, key investments uh, up front in the cuts that uh, are launched initially, the trillion dollars, including, like I said, Pell Grants, which are so vital uh, to uh, our future uh, economic growth and to the education of Americans because it uh, creates a firewall between in those uh, domestic uh, discretionary cuts or rather those discretionary cuts it, it creates a firewall that ensures that uh, savings are gleaned not just from uh, non-defense discretionary programs but from defense uh, and then it 
uh, creates a, a process through the Joint Committee which uh, will allow for the President and Democrats and others, uh, including a lot of Republicans who have, uh, an express, uh, have this view and have expressed it recently, that we need to take a balanced approach uh, going further as we seek more deficit reduction. And that balanced approach would include uh, revenues. And you mentioned job creating measures. What's the strategy at this point on getting a payroll tax extension, which wasn't included in this measure? Is the President still committed to doing that, and how do you do it? The President is committed to doing that, and I think it's important to remember that when the President uh, publicly and vocally talked about uh, endorsing the idea of including an extension of the payroll tax cut as part of a grand bargain or a, a, a big deal. Uh, that is not the case in this deal that is short of a grand bargain, but it is no, there is no question that he will continue to push for this. And, and he will make the argument that uh, it is absolutely essential to continue to put extra money in Americans' pockets as they deal with high energy prices and high food prices uh, next year as, uh, because it was so important this year. We certainly look forward to having that uh, uh, debate in the fall. Uh, and he will press very strongly for it. I note that it, there was uh, broad bipartisan consensus beyond the creation of this tax cut uh, at the end of uh, 2010, and so we certainly expect there would be broad bipartisan consensus to extend it uh, for next year. Yes? House Republicans seem to be arguing that, that this super committee is going to have a difficult time doing any tax reform uh, because it's going to be supported by the CBO and the Bush tax cuts are set to expire in January 2013. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you comment on that? Well, I, I, I've seen that, and I would simply say that the suggestion that it is impossible for the Joint Committee to raise tax revenue is simply not accurate. It's false. Uh, if the Joint Committee decides, for example, that, a ba that part of a balanced deal should be to eliminate tax subsidies for oil and gas companies uh, or corporate jets, or if they decide to limit the value of itemized deductions um, for high-income earners, as the President has called for, they can do that and they would raise revenue through doing that. Second, nothing in the legislation that's being considered by Congress uh, specifies at all that the committee operate under any specific baseline. Any suggestion otherwise is simply false. But doesn't it, doesn't it apply to the Budget Act? Isn't it a, the Budget but, Act? But the, the committee can act accordingly, uh, according to whatever uh, baseline it chooses. It could act, for example, it could decide to use, uh, operate under the baseline used by the Fiscal Commission that assumed the expiration of the Bush, Bush high income tax cuts. Or they could operate under a current policy baseline, which is what Speaker Boehner was relying on when he said he had agreed to $800 billion in revenue. So it's simply, uh, it's simply not accurate that this committee uh, can't uh, consider and act on uh, revenue raisers. And, and, and that includes lowering rates, not just the provisions you talked about, but it Well, again, I mentioned the, 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 the Bush tax cuts as, as part of that. And, and let's also be clear that, uh, one, that the President has made whatever the result, if Congress does not act on tax reform, which, by the way, broadly speaking, is supported by both parties, a desire for tax reform. So there is great incentive created in this committee to deal with tax reform because of the, uh, remember, it will be a balanced committee between Republicans and Democrats, and they need to produce a product that will then be, have fast-track authority and be voted on by Congress. Uh, it is certainly our expectation that that product will include revenue as well as uh, other areas of finding deficit reduction. If it fails either to produce something or if Congress fails to act on it, uh, you can be sure that the President uh, will uh, honor his promise to veto any legislation that would extend the Bush high income tax cuts beyond uh, 2012, uh, which would of course create nearly a trillion dollars in revenue raisers uh, when that happens. Uh, in, in Afghanistan, um, the most recent month for which uh, statistics are available, I think May and June, indicate that uh, ISAF casualties are down 40 percent and civilian, Afghan civilian casualties are up 50 percent. Mm -hmm. Why is that? You know, I would refer you to the Department of Defense. I haven't, I, I confess I haven't uh, studied that, uh, those numbers uh, of late. Uh, but obviously, uh, you know, the, the situation is um, continues to be uh, uh, a tough one, at, uh, and, and, and fighting continues to, uh, to occur. Uh, but we believe we've made significant progress in implementing the policy proposal that the President put forward, uh, and we are now in the process of implementing the drawdown, uh, as uh, he uh, made clear in his address not long ago, in drawing down the surge forces uh, uh, beginning now. Does it concern the administration, the President, that well, again, I haven't looked at those numbers, so I don't have a specific uh, 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 response uh, related to those numbers. But obviously, uh, we believe very strongly that 
uh, we are in a position where we can begin to draw down those forces, uh, and we are continuing to do so. so yeah. So how hopeful are you, or how hopeful is the president, I should say, that this plan will help avoid a downgrade in the credit rating? Well, we take action and, and control the things that we can control. And, 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 and what is important about this is that we have not uh, simply averted uh, what would have been an absolute disaster, assuming, again, Congress acts, which would have been uh, passing a period beyond which we would no longer have had borrowing authority and, and risking, the, uh, poss you know, creating the possibility of default on our obligations for the first time in our history. Uh, but we have lifted that cloud of uncertainty for a sustained period of time. And we think that coupled with the real and significant deficit reduction that is part of this package uh, and the enforcement mechanisms that guarantee further deficit reduction uh, is taken before the end of the year. We believe that um, that should send a re very reassuring message around the world, uh, as well as around the country, obviously, uh, that Washington is beginning to get its fiscal house in order. So is it fair to say that your concern in that area is much diminished? <laughs> well, our primary concern was that we uh, reach an agreement, a compromise, a bipartisan deal uh, that would ensure that we lift the cloud of uncertainty created by this uh, debt crisis. Uh, we have done that and that we would, uh, through that uh, process, uh, ensure that we would have significant balanced deficit reduction. We've done that as well. Um, we certainly hope that that sends a signal that uh, Washington is getting its act together and dealing with these tough issues. Do you think it's enough? Enough for? To, to avert that? Oh, again, I'm not, I, I just, I, I don't really have a comment on uh, uh, how the rating agencies uh, make their judgments. All I know is that we in Washington the policymakers and the elected officials uh, can do the things that we can do to ensure that the American economy is uh, going in the right direction and that we are uh, demonstrating that we're getting our fiscal house in order uh, and then uh, hope that that message uh, is made clear. What kind of assurances did Democratic and Republican leaders give the President that they can get the votes to pass this? Well, I think it was part of the agreement uh, was the expectation that they could get the votes to, to pass this and, and uh, hopefully they will. Do you have a signing ceremony? Uh, I don't have any announcement or <laughs> scheduling uh, announcements to make on that. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the president and the vice president are selling this to members of Congress by saying it's a victory for the American people. How is this a victory for the American people when it still adds seven trillion dollars to the deficit over the next ten years? Uh, because it significantly reduces the deficit, it significantly uh, addresses some of the drivers, or will address some of the drivers of our long-term debt. Uh, and if you're asking, does the government continue to function, and uh, does do we still owe, uh, do we still have to borrow money on uh, uh, to pay our bills? Yes, that 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 has not been eliminated. We will continue to have a debt. The point is, economically, is to begin to get the growth in our deficits and the growth in our debt under control. And that is what this agreement begins to do very significantly. Is, will all the work be done? Absolutely not. That's why the Joint Committee's work is so important. Uh, and I'm sure uh, even as that occurs and takes place, there will be more work that is necessary. But, but this is significant, and it should not be discounted. I mean, it, it's a little, not only the ink hasn't even been printed on the paper yet, let alone signed into law, and we're already talking about how it's not substantial enough or what the next step is, I think we ought to all take a step back and remember where we were 24, 48 hours ago, a week ago, two weeks ago. Uh, the prospect uh, that was hanging out there that America would not honor its obligations for the first time in its history and the impact that would have on our economy and the global economy uh, and the fact that uh, while um, I got a number of questions, understandably, during briefings in recent days and weeks about why we were optimistic that we could reach a bipartisan compromise uh, because it looked so unlikely. The fact is, here we stand today, uh, less than 24 hours after that compromise was reached, uh, anticipating votes in both houses of Congress that will achieve something rather significant. Yes, that's a victory for the American people. Uh, you talked about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, the President talked a lot about shared sacrifice. Mm -hmm. He talked about ending subsidies for oil companies. He mm -hmm. talked about ending tax break for corporate jet owners. He talked about that this was a very fair deal where he was offering three to one spending cuts, <coughs> one in tax revenues. Where are the tax revenues? Uh, well, Nora, I think we just addressed this, but I'll, I'll be happy to do it again. We did not get the grand bargain up front, and we all know why. 
okay? There were, as the Speaker himself said, $800 billion on the table in revenue as part of a grand bargain. There were uh, tough choices made by both sides in that potential agreement that was not reached, uh, and we did not get that done. Uh, the, the Speaker decided he could. Saying, we but, gave, gave them everything but no, they wanted, and we got no, nothing. No, I, I feel like I've taken this question two or three times already, and I've been very clear about how that's not the case. Uh, and in fact, uh, we had we got significant achievements. Uh, for, well, let's step back also. The President of the United States believes that deficit reduction is important. It is a a, a false setup to to suggest that somehow. A dollar in deficit reduction is a loss. It is a positive thing yeah, for Democrats. Deficit reduction has to be done with spending and revenue. Well, he does, and that's why the, he fully expects that the Joint Committee will uh, include tax revenue as part of its consideration and its product. But as you know throughout this process, there were uh, cuts uh, identified through the Vice President-led process uh, in uh, domestic spending uh, and also in the uh, uh, presidential-led process with the Speaker of the House. And you see that embodied in the first tranche of uh, spending cuts that is part of this deal. I mean, those, that's, that is not a negative, that is a positive. As the President made clear, progressives need to understand, and we think most obviously do, that deficit reduction is essential, done in the right way, because we need to get our fiscal house in order, in order to ensure that we can uh, do the things we need to do to grow the economy and make the key investments we need to make. Finally, can you address um, the word that the New York Times used today in a front page piece that the President has been diminished? Well, I disagree. I think the President uh, showed uh, enormous leadership through this process. Uh, again, he uh, directed the Vice President to lead the talks with the House Majority Leader uh, that produced the basically the foundation of the initial round of tax cuts that were, I mean, of spending cuts that were part of any envisioned compromise. Uh, he then initiated uh, and had sustained negotiations with the Speaker of the House, which, while they did not bear fruit in the terms of an agreed-upon grant compromise, they made clear through that process uh, that for significant deficit reduction to be achieved beyond the initial round of uh, spending cuts that are part of this agreement, uh, there has to be balance. That was agreed upon. It was on the table, rather, uh, put on the table by the Speaker of the House and acknowledged. It was certainly acknowledged by the nearly 20 Republican senators who endorsed the ideas behind the Gang of Six. I think a, a threshold has been crossed here. And the, the beauty of that is, is that the elected leaders here are catching up to the American public who overwhelmingly support the President's position that balance is really essential as we approach these hard, uh, hard uh, uh, choices. So uh, we think. Uh, the President's uh, leadership has been essential to that process and will uh, furthermore ensure that the kind of deficit reduction we get in the future uh, will be the right kind for the American people. Yeah. But Jay, where are the tax revenues? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on taxes. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> on, on taxes, one of the ways you're selling this overall plan is that, as you started the briefing, the cloud of uncertainty has been lifted. Mm -hmm. And businesses were saying, are we going to default? The American people are saying, my interest rate's going to go up. Businesses are also telling the President all the time, he says this in his public speeches, they want certainty on taxes, they want certainty on, on all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so do the American people, they want to know what their taxes are going to be. So um, while on one hand you have certainty about no default, isn't there now a lot of uncertainty about taxes? Because as you've been, <clears throat> pardon me, spending the last 10, 15 minutes, Nobody really knows where the tax rates are going to be. You're saying well, tax, no, no, no. taxes are on the table in round two. Republicans are saying, no, they're really not. Well, I, I think I addressed that issue, the, the baseline issue, which we are quite clear about, is simply not part of the deal, and, and, it, and it's irrelevant because the committee can take whatever action it chooses. The President has made clear that when we talk about the need for balance, and raising revenue as part of a broader approach to deficit reduction. We are talking about protecting average Americans, not just protecting them from tax hikes, but as uh, was noted earlier, extending tax cuts for them. Uh, this President has, since he take, has taken office, cut taxes significantly for uh, working Americans. The only, uh, at, at the marginal rate level, at the income tax level, the only rates that the President has sought to uh, return to the levels of the Clinton administration, which, by the way, uh, was a period of the longest sustained expansion 
uh, economic expansion in the post-war American history, uh, where 23 million jobs were created, and where rich people did very well indeed, which is a good thing, uh, those rates prevailed. He thinks we should return to those rates as part of a process where uh, everyone shares in the sacrifice necessary to get our deficits and debt under control. Now, we may not get there because tax reform is a goal of his as well, and it's a, it is a goal uh, shared by a lot of Republicans. And if, and if the committee can produce tax reform that raises revenues and contributes to deficit reduction but, but simplifies the tax code, uh, that would also be a good thing. But it will not result uh, in, uh, and we certainly, well, we certainly do not want it to result in uh, uh, putting added burdens on average Americans. Uh, this President's approach has been just the opposite. Quick follow, <coughs> pardon me, quick follow on Medicare. Um, making a big deal about saying Medicare beneficiaries will not be touched in round two. That if there are these drastic cuts, they would affect Medicare providers. Mm -hmm. But doctors are already saying they, they're dropping Medicare patients. Uh, they're not getting enough reimbursement. And so if you hit providers, it's going to wind up affecting senior citizens, isn't it? Well, let me just be so clear. Gets knocked off. You're talking about, let's just for, for everyone watching, that, that, that we are talking about the trigger, the enforcement mechanism for the second stage here, uh, which is onerous for a reason. Uh, it is onerous uh, while it does, and it is very important to remember uh, that low-income pro pro programs, including Medicaid, uh, as well as Social Security and Medicare benefits, uh, uh, would be an exempted. Medicare caps cuts would be capped, limited to the provider side. Uh, and yet, this is still tough stuff, and it's supposed to be tough stuff, uh, just like the uh, envisioned 50 percent cuts in our defense budget uh, so that Congress doesn't go there. Uh, so that the, the, the whole purpose of a trigger is that uh, nobody wants to pull it. So that focuses the mind of uh, members of Congress uh, on the need for the Joint Committee to produce a product that can pass in fast track manner, pass uh, both houses of Congress and be signed into law. And that would be uh, a very uh, welcome result of this. So if, if you're asking me is the uh, is, are the enforcement mechanisms here tough? Yes, the answer is they are. Right, but you're trying to sell it as Medicare beneficiaries won't be hurt. It will just be the providers. But in fact, if providers get hit, it affects senior citizens. Beneficiaries well, the, the, the get program, hit. Uh, the program's integrity is sustained. The beneficiaries are, do not see their, the, the, their benefits cut. The, you know, the, 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 the cuts are capped and limited to the provider side. That is written into the agreement. Yes. The New York Times today, Paul Krugman wrote, this deal will damage an already depressed economy. It will probably make America's long-run deficit problem worse, not better. How does the White House respond to that? Democracy? Well, we, we, we obviously disagree. Uh, we think that done well, done wisely, uh, and in a way that protects key investments, that uh, deficit reduction will help the economy. We think that will be the case here. And it is also why, as it, I, I mentioned earlier, why the President will uh, continue to push for uh, the uh, extension of the payroll tax cut uh, that uh, put $1,000 or is putting $1,000 uh, in the average American family's uh, pocket this year. He hopes to extend that next year. He believes there will be bipartisan support for doing that. So you need to take – that's why balance is so important. And timing, as the cuts are, are – are, uh, uh, enacted is so important, and, 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 and where those cuts come from is so important. We believe that uh, overall, done well, that the uh, positive impact of the fact that Washington is getting its act together and getting its fiscal house in order uh, uh, will outweigh uh, the effect, the negative effect of cuts because of the way the cuts are structured uh, and enacted uh, and because of the protections that uh, are embedded in this legislation. In addition to balance, the President also talked a lot about not wanting to kick the can down the road. Doesn't this deal, in essence, kick the can down the road? I mean, it's not really dealing with any of the hot-button issues now. Well, I appreciate that uh, – I mean, the question goes to the President's very strong desire that he articulated many times to get a grand bargain up front, which would have required that he and the Speaker reach an agreement. That didn't happen. We don't have to re relive uh, that disappointing past, but uh, the process did produce uh, a lot of positive 
uh, product that can be used by the special committee, for example, the joint committee, going forward if they're looking at a balanced approach to further deficit reduction, dealing with entitlement reform and tax reform. Uh, there is no question that the President preferred a grand bargain uh, up front that would have dealt with all of these issues all at once. Once that was not going to happen, what we needed to do was ensure, A, that the debt ceiling was lifted uh, for an extended period of time so the cloud of uncertainty would be removed from our economy. Uh, and B, that we got significant, we nevertheless got significant deficit reduction uh, that was balanced. And we believe that this compromise, while not perfect, achieves that. And that while uh, on the issue of tax and reform and entitlement reform, uh, the can is kicked a little bit down the road. The fact is that the legislation uh, it forces action on this very soon. The committee must report out by Thanksgiving. Congress must give an up and down, up or down vote by Christmas. Uh, in terms of the way that Congress uh, normally uh, uh, rolls, that's pretty darn fast. But given that we were facing what you have said would have been an economic crisis if the mm -hmm. debt ceiling is not raised tomorrow, why should people have so much faith that these triggers will actually motivate this bipartisan committee to act when really the triggers well, let's are be, cutting? Let's, let's be clear the about the triggers. First of all, they're owners for both sides, and, and I think that the proof of that has been seen by the reaction uh, in some quarters. Uh, but they are designed precisely to uh, incentivize Congress to act. What the triggers also do if Congress, either the committee fails or Congress rejects the committee's product, is that it will ensure that significant deficit reduction is enacted anyway. So when you, either way, you will have significant deficit reduction. We hope, and we also believe that most members of Congress and both parties hope, that that will be accomplished through the Joint Committee uh, because the alternative is so onerous. Yeah, Carol. Just to follow on that, but the way that the trigger is structured, it doesn't actually kick in until January of 2013. So what incentive does Congress have or the committee have to act in November or December if the real pain doesn't come until January 2013, and how is this not set up so that the Republicans, the President, Democrats are having the same fight all through the election? Well, I'm sure they'll have the same fight because there's a, obviously a, an honest set of differences about how, uh, you know, how uh, government should behave, its role, its effectiveness, uh, and. And, and that will be a debate that will, I'm sure, take place throughout next year. The debate we won't be having is whether or not the debt ceiling should be raised. We will not have a situation where people will hold the American economy hostage uh, in order to achieve a, a, a specific agenda, uh, at least not uh, until 2013. So uh, we think that is incredibly important as a matter of uh, economic good. Uh, and uh, and that, is a, that is a significant achievement that this uh, uh, created by this agreement. Uh, in terms of the, I mean, the, the, the trigger, the, the provisions ca called for by the trigger are onerous. I think everybody agrees to that. Uh, it's a matter of law, and we do believe that Congress will want to avoid it. But how, but you're saying, but your argument in that it's not keeping the hand down the road is saying that Congress and the President are going to deal with this in the fall, but they really don't have to deal with this but until it, but, 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 January no, but, of 2013. But that's like saying that any 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 law you pass tomorrow because it uh, in, its implementation is over a certain period of time is meaningless. It's not the case. And it, the fact is it will, it will uh, enact into law significant reductions, whether through the Joint Committee or through the trigger provisions. And uh, we believe that the committee will want to avoid uh, the uh, the trigger being uh, pulled, and therefore, hopefully, will uh, take action uh, in a balanced way. Jay, as you know, the uh, CBO had issues with the savings numbers in uh, a couple of the previous proposals. How confident are you that uh, this is going to pass muster? Well, well I mean, I, I'm, I believe it will pass muster. I haven't seen uh, CBO yet on this. And just a quick logistical question. Uh, how do you all plan to respond to as, as these two votes are taken? Will we see the President again? Uh, I, I, you know, we're still, even though the cloud is mostly lifted, we're still in that period where uh, things are pretty fluid, so I don't, I, I cannot anticipate uh, whether or not the President will, will, uh, uh, will stand before you again anytime soon. Senate chaplain saw a rainbow, by the way. <laughs> I like that. Yes, sir.
Uh, back to the rating agency, just a moment, or a cleanup question. Are, is anybody in the administration talking to the rating agencies to, to make I don't arguments know. to them, either here or at the uh, I just don't know. I mean, I think there are, you, I would direct you to Treasury uh, that normally handles that stuff, and I think uh, uh, that's ex pretty much taps me out on my knowledge. Let me, uh, let me shift to another economic question. There was a manufacturing index that was out, that was out this morning, a widely watched one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it showed U.S. manufacturing uh, in July expanded at the slowest rate of two years. Mm -hmm. uh, many businesses citing cutbacks, just lack of demand. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sperling on uh, the talk show yesterday said that he saw, or the administration sees, a growth rate of a possibly 3% in the second half of this year. Well, what, uh, what, I, think, that what I think Gene said is that there is a, uh, I think that is a general uh, consensus out there about what growth might look like in the third and fourth quarters. The ISM that you're talking about is not for the third or fourth quarter. It's for second quarter or the July of the second quarter. So uh, what, what we have acknowledged all along is that growth is not fast enough, that job creation is not substantial enough. Uh, it, of late, and, and one of the, I mean, there are a number of reasons for that. Some of the headwinds that were caused uh, that were obviously out of Washington's control, the earthquake and tsunami uh, that uh, uh, did so much damage in Japan and disrupted supply lines and therefore uh, had uh, direct impact uh, impact on, on the American economy as well as the global economy, and, and uh, the higher fuel prices that were uh, caused by, uh, in large part, by the Arab Spring and, and the unrest there. So. Uh, we uh, and then and then the ongoing issues in, in Europe. So, you know, we continue to manage the the uh, effect of those headwinds. Uh, we believe that it is very important that we have uh, hopefully uh, averted what would have been the most substantial headwind of all, which is the uh, a default for the first time in our history, and that uh, that will contribute to uh, a more positive environment that we hope will allow for greater growth and job creation. You have a lot of tools left, though, in your quiver. We got a quiver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what sort of uh, lawmakers would the White House like to see, or what characteristics uh, on the Joint Committee? Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, 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 I know there's an urge to, 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 to leap forward. I don't, I, don't, I don't know yet. Well, I think what we would like to see is people who are serious about the task, who are serious about uh, the need to take an approach um, that can uh, uh, create a consensus uh, and that is balanced and, and, and who believe that significant deficit reduction is uh, in the country's interest if it's done well and in a balanced way. Yeah. Um, you've used words like it was very messy, it was a circus. Um, I think the President himself said that the crisis was imposed by Washington on the rest of America. I mean, there's a sense that it was a self-imposed, you know, self-created crisis. What, in retrospect, then, what could the President and the White House have done differently over the past month that would have averted such a self-imposed crisis, you know, sort of in terms of performance, in terms of managing this? Well, uh, I'm sure we'll all have time to look back at this, and uh, we'll read your TikToks with great interest uh, when you write them uh, about how it all unfolded. I mean, we feel that the President made very clear what his priorities were. Uh, he uh, tried to force the process forward uh, at every juncture uh, through uh, beginning with his framework, through to the creation uh, right after that of the uh, of the negotiating body led by the vice president, uh, his uh, sideline, uh, offline uh, negotiations with the Speaker of the House, uh, his constant uh, exhortations to Congress to be willing to compromise uh, uh, because the American people so demanded compromise. Uh, it is simply a fact that we have a divided government and we have uh, some divergent views here, and, uh, and, and that resolving, uh, reaching compromise is not always easy, but we believe that it is important to note that we achieved that and, uh, and that that uh, is a building block going forward, we hope so. If it is a circus and it was messy, I mean, does the White House share of responsibility and, and feel like... Uh, well, I, I just think, I think I answered the question. I, I think I laid out the steps that this president took. He's obviously not an elected member of Congress uh, and uh, cannot control uh, the approach taken by the 535 members of that body. Yeah. Um, Jay, when people talk about the trigger and the automatic spending cuts, it's, it seems to be portrayed as the Democrats won't want to risk deep cuts to entitlements, Republicans won't want to risk deep cuts to the Pentagon budget. But don't deep cuts to the Pentagon budget also threaten the administration? We, we are not in support of cuts of that size. We, the President laid out in his framework uh, his belief that 
uh, working with uh, then Secretary Gates and now Secretary Panetta that we can identify a further $400 billion uh, over 12 years in, in, uh, uh, in uh, reductions in, in defense spending. Uh, and we achieve uh, pretty much that, something on the order of that, in this first round of uh, uh, firewalled discretionary spending cuts. So you're right. I mean, this is not. We, uh, let's make clear that the president, as commander in chief, and and the way he views uh, defense spending, does not support, uh, would not support uh, these kinds of cuts envisioned in the triggering me mechanism uh, either. But that, but this is the point. I mean, none of these none of these outcomes are positive, uh, and that is why they are to be avoided, and why we believe Congress will uh, avoid them and 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 act uh, through the Joint Committee. Were you to have these automatic cuts in military spending, would it impede the nation's ability to wind down Iraq, to slowly wind down Afghanistan, to maintain its involvement in Libya? <coughs> would all of these various uh, national undertakings be called into question if you suddenly face the prospect of deep? Well, there are a lot of ifs, and I think, uh, as a as a point made earlier by Carol, uh, the fact is is that those cuts would not begin until 2013, if that trigger uh, went off, was pulled. Uh, and I think that, uh, as you know, we are withdrawing all of our forces from Iraq, and we are uh, already engaged in the uh, drawdown of our surge forces in Afghanistan. So uh, having said that, I'll go back to my first point, which is that the President does not, has not called for, and would not uh, support these kinds of cuts in defense spending. Uh, he, he believes that uh, that opinion will be shared broadly by members of Congress. Uh, and that for that reason, we will not get there, that this, this trigger will not be pulled, and therefore we will uh, achieve significant deficit reduction in a more balanced way. Yeah. Okay. I'm still not clear on the fate of the grand bargain. Is it something that the committee could still conceivably take a crack at? Sure. Uh, is it possible that there might be additional offline discussions, as you've described, the President's dealing with Speaker Boehner? Or is it definitively off until after the election? Well, anything's possible in terms of offline offline discussions, and uh, I'm sure you'll read about them at some point when somebody leaks them. But the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, obviously a portion of the grand bargain will have been uh, acted on already, the upfront, the initial spending cuts. The what I was talking about, what, what has been provided by the work, the positive work that the Speaker of the House and the President did, is a, a, a lot of detail about how you could get to significant tax reform and entitlement reform, and the savings that you could glean from that, the deficit reduction you could glean from that. Uh, and while the committee will, may have its own ideas between uh, what the President and Speaker of the House were working on, the Gang of Six proposal, Domenici Rivlin, Simpson Bowles, there, there's a lot of their work will have been started for them, and they can frame a package uh, that we believe will uh, hopefully uh, achieve significant deficit reduction in a balanced way. As, I mean, uh, further deficit reduction, looking at the hard issues of entitlement reform and tax reform. Do you expect that they're ever going to produce a $4 trillion package? Well, the four trillion, the three to four, depending on where we ended up, included within it the uh, spending cuts that will have, uh, that are part of this deal that was reached yesterday. So the answer is not in that form. But I think that if 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 I mean, we are going to get upwards of three trillion dollars in deficit reduction through the agreement reached yesterday, and uh, assuming as we do or hoping as we do that uh, the second tranche of that will come through the. Uh, action of the Joint Committee and the vote by Congress on the product of the Joint Committee, that it will include the kind of balance uh, that uh, was uh, being worked on by the Speaker and the President. Yeah. Uh, April. April's right here. I'm sorry, April. I saw you and then I looked over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to call it, and then I'm going to call an and the other A, yeah. Okay, April, you go. Well, I called your name. You're next. Oh, well, thank you. Um, Jay, um, leaders. It's like a trick, you know, pass when you're doing that. Yeah, you know a lot about trips. Um, <laughs> um, leading up to the agreement, the president kept talking about compromise. He kept talking about compromise. Was this a true compromise, or did Republicans get more of a compromise than the president? We believe it's a true compromise. And I announced, uh, I mean, I enunciated rather early on in this session uh, many of the reasons why and the accomplishments that we believe. Uh, 
uh, make it uh, a deal that Democrats should, uh, should support or we hope they do support. Uh, so uh, nobody here, and I think you're hearing it from the other side as well, believes they got everything they want because they didn't get everything they want. It is not uh, an agreement that uh, could have been crafted by the President or Democrats alone, and it's not an agreement that could have been or would have been crafted by, as we've seen uh, through the measures that they have tried to enact, by the House Republicans alone or Senate Republicans. So. Uh, it is a balanced compromise, reflective of a divided government uh, in a situation where action had to be taken by Congress uh, and therefore some sort of consensus had to emerge, bipartisan consensus or compromise had to emerge from Congress. Now also on the ratings agencies, did this, um, some office within this campus send the ratings agencies during the, the process information as to what they were looking at because throughout the process they kept saying, oh, you know, uh, you're going to lose your, your credit or your AAA credit rating and things of that nature, you're going to default. Was this administration actively sending credit agencies or rating agencies information about possible possibilities for an agreement? Well, I don't know about possible. I, 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 I don't know uh, a great deal about the communications that administrations have with the rating agencies, but I know that they have communications, as a, uh, I believe they have communications as a regular matter as the ratings agencies seek information about uh, what's happening and, 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 and that sort of thing. But I, I would refer you to Treasury for more details. I'm going to ask you one final question with that. Do you believe that S&P Standard & Poor's overstepped their boundaries uh, because America was, Americans, taxpayers, were very concerned about the credit rating? People were, uh, some critics are saying that people were made anxious. There was anxiety about this. There was, I, I, I don't really have uh, any response because uh, I, I, it's simply not for me to evaluate uh, an independent rating agency's uh, processes. But I will say that there was reason to be anxious, absolute reason to be anxious. Uh, while we remained justifiably in the uh, confident that in the end Congress would do the right thing, that uh, the leaders uh, were, would all be true to their word and, and take action to, in or, uh, to ensure that we would avoid default, uh, that prospect was there, uh, clearly. And uh, it had an impact on uh, the markets and on people's psychology about where uh, what was happening in Washington. And, and that's why we think it is such an, a significant achievement to, to get, we hope, get beyond that process and to, to ensure that we don't have this kind of negative uh, I mean, it's the kind of debate that is so bad for our economy uh, in the next several months or six months or ten months, but we, we, we push off this uh, well, I issue uh, through 2012. Did that anxiety stem from the S&P saying I, that I, the I triple don't, I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe that's the case. I think prior to that and prior to discussions of that, there was uh, ample reason as we approached the August 2nd deadline uh, for people to be concerned about whether or not Congress would in fact do the responsible thing, and we're obviously uh, happy that an agreement was reached. Yes, sir. Thanks, Jay. I have uh, two quick questions. Um, first of all, uh, throughout this process, you and everybody saying pretty much has agreed that the uh, threat of a default was a catastrophic one. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm wondering why the response from the outset wasn't, you know, well, we can talk about what you want after you put the pin back in the grenade, and what are the chances that that's how the president will respond when this comes up in his second term? I like the phrasing, I, 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 and, I, and I like the notion, uh, the, the confidence that, that we'll be uh, discussing this um, in early 2013. Uh, I, I honestly haven't lifted my sights to the horizon there to, to anticipate what that discussion or what that debate will look like. Clearly, as, as, as all of you have noted in your pieces, uh, th this debate will continue uh, about the broader issues between Democrats and Republicans, and the president and, and, and his opponent when there is one. No, there's no question that debate will, will continue, and, and the president looks forward to that debate as we move towards next year's election. What was important is that this action be taken and that Congress acts today and tomorrow to ensure that uh, we do the right thing by our economy and by the American people. Uh, the political debate around this will obviously rage on next year and beyond, and that's the nature of our politics. I mean, why even let that, you know, a, a political issue get tied to a doomsday thing like the debt ceiling? Why, well, why not just say, we yeah, obviously, we're not going to talk about that? We, I don't, uh, un, 
what the reality is that, that, that statutorily Congress had to uh, has to act to raise the debt ceiling. You, you are correct that in the past, while it has sometimes been an unpleasant vote for members of Congress, it was not uh, used in this way, uh, and we found that unfortunate. But but that was the reality that we face, and and uh, through this process we were able to uh, accomplish some important goals, uh, including extending the debt ceiling through 2012, but also uh, achieving. Uh, the kind of upfront deficit reduction we believe is significant uh, in a way that's balanced between def defense and, and non-defense discretionary spending and, and create a mechanism that, that allows uh, hopefully for the uh, enactment of fur further balanced deficit reduction through entitlement reform and tax reform. My second question, um, you talk about the uh, triggers being onerous to both sides, but I mean there's really a third side involved here, the Tea Party. And, you know, if the threat of a default didn't make them blink, what makes you think given the opportunity to, to defeat uh, uh, revenue increases that they won't say, sure, you know what, cut away, it's right in our briar patch. Well, I think that the trigger mechanism is uh, devised in a way that it that there is uh, unpleasantness for everyone of uh, pretty much every political persu uh, persuasion up on Capitol Hill, and, and that if we get to that, we hope we don't, there will be, uh, or when we get to the stage of making choices about uh, voting for uh, what the Joint Committee produces, that, uh, that there is an assessment made by the leadership in both parties and others that, uh, again, this is a lot of ifs here, but that, the, that, that what will have been produced by the Joint Committee uh, to achieve this significant further deficit reduction is uh, a far better approach than what would happen if the trigger was pulled. We, we, we simply believe that and that's why it's so important to have a kind of mechanism like that. And, and I wrote, it's very similar, by the way, to the me mechanism that was in place through Graham, Rudman, Hollings uh, that uh, led to the 1990 budget agreement, which was the first of three budget agreements which laid the groundwork, created the foundation for, as I mentioned before, the longest peacetime, peacetime expansion in American history uh, and the creation of 23 million jobs in the 1990s. So uh, these. Uh, the, the, the threat of these tr triggers being pulled uh, can force Congress to do uh, significant things that can be very, very good for the economy. Thank you. See the skepticism. Cheryl, I'm going to do the last one for you. Sorry. Oh, well, and then I owe Anne. Okay. Anne, then Cheryl, and then I'm done. Uh, two months from today, new fiscal year. Does, the, does this process mean that the President just expects a continuing resolution on by September 30th, or does Congress continue to work on appropriations? Oh, Ann, please don't make me, like, dive into that debate today. I don't even know. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we, we keep, we're keeping hope alive here for uh, uh, positive uh, negotiations and uh, agreements with Congress. Sure. And, and amazingly, my, my question was similar in that did you, you, get, any, did you get any agreements from Republicans that they aren't going to extract spending cuts for continuing resolutions? Because they are going to have to redo all their appropriations bill now under the new package. I think the agreements that, that, that were made between Democrats and Republicans and, and, and the White House are all uh, written down for you to see. I don't have none other that I'm aware of. Thanks, guys.